the story. I look at the ring, layered with fresh sawdust. I look at the skylight, at the half-hidden moon. I just thought of a story, I say. Is it a made-up story or a true one? Ruby asks. True, I say. I hope. Ruby leans against the bars. Her eyes hold the pale moon in them, the way a still pond holds stars. Once upon a time, I say, there was a baby elephant. She was smart and brave, and she needed to go to a place called a zoo. What's a zoo? Ruby asks. A zoo, Ruby, is a place where humans make amends. A good zoo is a place where humans care for animals and keep them safe. Did the baby elephant get to the zoo? Ruby asks softly. I don't answer right away. Yes, I say at last. How did she get there? Ruby asks. She had a friend, I say. A friend who made a promise. How? It takes a long time, but finally Ruby returns to sleep. Avin? Bob whispers, yawning. What you said about the zoo? How are you going to do it? Suddenly, I feel as if I could sleep for a thousand days. I don't know, I admit. You'll think of something, Bob says confidently, his voice trailing off as his eyes close. What if I don't? I ask, but Bob is already asleep. His little red feet dance, and I know he's running in his dreams. Remembering. Bob and Ruby sleep on. I don't sleep. I think about the promise I made to Stella, and the pictures I've made for Ruby. And I remember. I remember it all. What they did. We were clinging to our mother, my sister and I, when the humans killed her. They shot my father next. Then they chopped off their hands, their feet, their heads. Something else to buy. There is a cluttered, musty store near my cage. They sell an ashtray there. It is made from the hand of a gorilla. Another Ivan. When morning comes and the parking lot glimmers with dew, I see the billboard on the highway. There I am, the one and only Ivan, bathed in the pink light of dawn. I look so angry with my furrowed brow and clenched fists. I look the way my father did the day the men came. I am, I suppose, a peaceful sort. Mostly, I watch the world go by and think about naps and bananas and yogurt raisins. But inside me, hidden, is another Ivan. He could tear a grown man's limbs off his body. In the flicker of time it takes a snake's tongue to taste the air, he could taste revenge. He is the Ivan on the billboard. I stare at the one and only Ivan, at the faded picture of Stella, and I remember George and Mac on their ladders, adding the picture of Ruby to bring new visitors to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade. I remember the story Ruby told, the one where the villagers came to her rescue. I hear Stella's kind, wise voice. Humans can surprise you sometimes. <laughs> Humans can surprise you sometimes. I look at my fingers, coated in red paint the color of blood, and I know how to keep my promise. Days. During the days, I wait. During the nights, I paint. I worry when Mac takes Ruby into the ring. He carries the claw stick with him all the time now. He doesn't use it. He doesn't have to. Ruby isn't fighting back anymore. She does whatever Mac asks. Nights. I close my eyes. I dip my fingers into the paint. When I'm done with one piece of paper, I set it aside to dry. It's so small, just one sheet, and I'm going to need so many. I move on to the next, and the next, and the next. It's a giant puzzle, and I'm making the pieces one by one. 
By morning, my floor is covered with paintings. I hide the paintings under my pool of dirty water before Mac can see them. I don't want them to end up in the gift store, selling for $20 a piece, 25 with frame. These paintings are for Ruby, every one of them. Project. Ivan? Ruby asks one morning when I am trying to nap. Why are you always so sleepy during the day? I've been working on a project at night, I tell her. Oh, it's a project. It's a thing. A painting. It's a painting for you, actually, I answer. Ruby looks pleased. Can I see it? Not yet. Ruby pokes with annoyance at her roped foot. She takes a breath. Ivan, do I have to do the shows with Mac today? I'm afraid so. I'm sorry, Ruby. Ruby dips her trunk in her water bucket. That's okay, she says. I already knew the answer. Not right. It's night again, and everyone's asleep. I look at the picture I've just made, one of dozens. It's smudged and torn, a muddy blur. I place it beside the others lining my floor. The colors are wrong. The shapes are off. It looks like nothing. It's not what I'm trying to create. It's not what it's meant to be. It's not right, and I don't know why. Across the parking lot, the billboard beckons, as it always does. Come to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan, Mighty Silverback. If I could use human words to say what I need to say, this would all be so easy. Instead, I have my pots of paint and my ragged pages. I sigh. My fingertips glow like jungle flowers. I try again. Going Nowhere I watch Ruby plod around the ring in endless circles, going nowhere. More visitors have been coming, but not many. Max says Ruby's not picking up the slack after all. He says he's cutting back on our food. He says he's turning off the heat at night to save money. Ruby looks thinner to me, more wrinkled than Stella ever was. Do you think Ruby's eating enough? I ask Bob. I don't know. I'll tell you one thing, though. You're sure as heck painted enough. Bob wrinkles his nose. That stench is unbelievable. And I found yellow paint in my tail this morning. Bob isn't happy about my night painting. He says it's unnatural. Now, while I work at my art, Bob sleeps on knot tag. He claims he prefers her because she doesn't snore. He says her belly doesn't rise and fall and make him seasick. What is this plan of yours, anyway? Bob asks. If you explained it to me, I could help out. He gnaws at his tail. Maybe I could come up with something that doesn't involve, you know, paint. I can't explain it, I tell him. It's an idea in my head, but I can't get it right. In any way, I'm almost out of supplies. I should have known I wouldn't have enough. I kick at my tire swing. It's spattered with drops of blue paint. It's a stupid idea. I doubt that, Bob says. Smelly? Yes. Stupid? Never. Bad guys. Most of the day I doze. Late in the afternoon, Mac approaches. Bob slips under knot tag. He prefers to keep a low profile around Mac. Mac's gaze falls on my pool. A corner of one of my paintings is visible. What's that, big guy? He asks. I calmly eat an orange, ignoring him. My heart is racing. Mac kicks at my plastic pool. Underneath it are all the paintings. Mac yanks on a piece of paper. It slips out easily, and he doesn't seem to notice the other paintings. The page is striped with green, which is what happens when blue paint and yellow paint get together. It's supposed to be a patch of grass. Not bad. Where'd you get the paint anyway? George's kid? He considers. Hmm, I'll bet I can get 30 for this picture, maybe even 40. Mac turns on my TV. It's a western. 
There's a human with a big hat and a small gun. He has a shiny star pinned to his chest. That means he is the sheriff, and he will be getting rid of all the bad guys. If this sells quick, I'm getting you some more of that paint, buddy, Max says. He walks away with my painting. Ruby's painting. For a moment, I imagine what it would feel like to be the sheriff. Add. Good news, huh? Bob says when Max out of earshot. Looks like you might be getting some more supplies. I don't want to paint for Mac, I say. I'm painting for Ruby. You can do both, Bob says. You're an artist, after all. While I watch the movie, I try to come up with a new hiding place for my paintings. Maybe, I think, I could fold them once they're dry and stuff them into knot tag. It's a long movie. At the end, the sheriff marries the woman who owns the saloon, which is a watering hole for humans, but not horses. It's been a long time since I've seen a western that was also a romance. I liked that movie, I say to Bob. Too many horses, not enough dogs, he comments. An ad comes on. I don't understand ads. They're not like westerns, where you know who the bad guy is supposed to be. And they're hardly ever romantic, unless the man and the woman are brushing their teeth before they face lick. I watch an ad for underarm deodorant. How do you know who's who if they don't smell? I ask Bob. Humans reek, Bob replies. They just don't notice because they have incompetent noses. Another ad comes on. I see children and their parents buying tickets, just like the tickets Max sells. They laugh, enjoying their ice cream cones as they walk down a path. They pause to watch two sleepy-eyed cats, huge and striped, dozing in long grass. Tigers. I know, because I saw them on a nature show once. Words flash on the screen, accompanied by a drawing of a red giraffe. The giraffe vanishes, and I see a human family staring at another kind of family. Elephants, old and young. They're surrounded by rocks and trees and grass and room to wander. It's a wild cage. A zoo. I see where it begins and where it ends. The wall that says you are this and we are that and that is how it will always be. It's not a perfect place. Even in just a few fleeting seconds on my TV screen, I can see that. A perfect place would not need walls. But it's the place I need. I gaze at the elephants and then I look over at Ruby, small and alone. <coughs> Before the ad ends... I try to remember every last detail. Rocks, trees, tails, trunks. It's the picture I need to paint. <clears throat> Imagining. It's different now when I paint. I'm not painting what I see in front of me, a banana, an apple. I'm painting what I see in my head, things that don't exist. At least, not yet. Knock tag. I pull out Knot Tag's stuffing. Carefully, I fill her with my paintings, hiding them so Mac won't sell them. She's large, bigger than Bob, but I still have to crumple a few of them. Bob tries to settle on her for a nap. You've killed her, he complains. I had to, I say. I miss your stomach, Bob admits. It's so spacious. When Julia arrives, she notices that I've used up my paints and paper. Wow. Julia shakes her head. You are one serious artist, Ivan. One more thing. My finger painting has sold her $40 with frame. Mac is happy. He brings me a huge pile of paper and, a big bu and big buckets of paint. Get to work, he says. I paint for Mac during the day and for Ruby at night. I nap when I can. But my nighttime picture isn't quite right. It's big, that's for sure. When I place all the pieces on the floor of my cage side by side, the cement is almost completely covered. But something is still missing. Bob says I'm crazy. There's Ruby, he says, pointing with his nose. There's the zoo. There are other elephants. What's wrong with it? It needs one more thing, I say. Bob groans. You're being a temperamental artist. What could be missing? I stare at the huge expanse of colors and shapes. I don't know how to explain to Bob that it isn't done yet. I'll just have to wait, I say at last. 
Something will come to me, and then I'll know my painting is finally ready. The Seven O'Clock Show During the last show of the day, Ruby seems tired. When she stumbles, Mac reaches for the claw stick. I tense, waiting for her to strike back. Ruby doesn't even flinch. She just keeps plodding along, and after a while, Snickers jumps onto her back. Twelve. I lie in my cage with Bob in my stomach. We are watching Julia do her homework. She doesn't seem to be enjoying it. I can tell because she is sighing more than usual. Again, for the hundredth time, or maybe the thousandth, I wonder what is missing from my painting. And for the hundredth time, or maybe the thousandth, I don't have any answer. Dad, Julia says as George passes by with a mop, can I ask you a question? May I? George corrects. Ask away. Julia glances down at a piece of paper. What's the difference between the word spelled P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L and the one spelled P-R-I-N-C-I-P-L-E? The first one is the head of a school like Miss Garcia. The second one is a belief that helps you know what's right or wrong. He smiles. For example, it's against my principles to do my daughter's homework for her. Julia groans. If I'm going to be an artist when I grow up, why do I need to know how to spell? With a laugh, George heads off. Poor Julia, I think. Gorillas get by just fine without learning how to spell. All those endless letters, those sticks and circles and zigzags, filling up books and magazines, billboards and candy wrappers. Words. Humans love their words. I leap up. Bob goes flying straight into my pool. A word. You know how I feel about wet feet, Bob yells. He scrambles out of the water, shaking each foot in dismay. I look out my window at the billboard. I can still hear Mac's voice in my head. Come to the Exit 8 Big Top Ball and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan. Mighty Silverback. I count to twelve, and then I count again, just to be sure. I lay out sixteen pieces of poster board. Four down, four across. A perfect square. What are you up to? Bob demands. I'm guessing it doesn't involve sleep. It has to do with the billboard. That sign's a monstrosity, particularly since I'm not featured. I grab my bucket of red paint. You're not on the billboard because you're not in the show, I point out. Technically, I don't even live here, Bob says with a sniff. I'm homeless by choice. I know, I'm just saying. I study the billboard, then I make two fat lines like broom handles. Another fat line connects them. I stand back. What do you think? What is it? No, wait, let me guess. A ladder? Not a ladder, I say. A letter. At least, I think that's what they're called. I have to make three more. Bob cuddles up next to Knot Tag. Why? He asks, yawning. Because then I'll have a word. A very important word. I dip my fingers into the paint. What word? Bob asks. Home. Bob closes his eyes. That's not so important, he says quietly. Nervous. All day long, I knuckle walk circles around my cage. I'm so nervous I can't nap. I can't even eat. Well, not very much, anyway. I'm ready to show Julia what I've made. It has to be Julia. She's an artist. Surely she'll look, truly look at my painting. She won't notice the smudges and tears. She won't care if the pieces don't quite fit together. She'll see past all of that. Surely Julia will see what I've imagined. I watch Ruby trudge sullenly through the four o'clock show and I wonder, what will happen if I fail? What if I can't make Julia understand? But of course I know the answer. Nothing. Nothing will happen. Ruby will remain the main attraction at the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, conveniently located off I-95 with shows at two, four, and seven. 365 days a year, year after year.
after year. Showing Julia. It's time to show my work. The mall is silent, except for Thelma the macaw, who is practicing a new phrase. Uh-oh! Julia is finishing her homework. George is sweeping outside. Mac has gone home for the night. I grab knot tag and carefully pull out the folded papers. So many paintings, page after page, piece after piece of my giant puzzle. I pound on my glass and Julia glances over. Fingers trembling, I hold up one of my paintings. It's brown and green, a corner piece. Julia smiles. I display another picture and then another and another and another, each one a tiny part of the whole. Julia looks confused. But what is it? She asks. She shrugs. It doesn't matter. It's pretty just as it is. Uh-oh, says Thelma. No, I think. No, it does matter. More paintings. George calls out to Julia. He's done for the night. Grab your backpack, he says, and hurry. It's late. Gotta go, Ivan, Julia says. Julia doesn't understand. I have to find the right pieces. I dig through the pile. They're here somewhere. I know they are. I find one, another one, another. I try to hold four of them up against the glass. Bob, I say, help me, hurry. Bob grabs paintings with his teeth and drags them to me. One by one, I shove pictures through the window crack. They crumple and tear. There are too many pieces. My puzzle is too big. Careful, Ivan. Julia says, those might be worth millions someday. You never know. She arranges the paintings into a neat stack. I suppose Mac's going to want to sell these in the gift shop. She still doesn't understand. I shove more out the hole and more and more, all of them, one after another. So Ivan's been painting, has he? George says as he puts on his coat. A lot, says Julia with a laugh. A whole lot. You're not taking all those home with you, are you? George asks, I mean, no offense to Ivan, but they're just blobs. Julia thumbs through the towering stack of paintings. They might not be blobs to Ivan. Let's leave those by the office, George suggests. Mac will want to try selling them. Although, why anyone would pay 40 bucks for a finger painting, a two-year-old could do, I don't know. I like Ivan's work, Julia says. He puts his feelings into them. He puts his hair into them, George says. Julia waves goodbye. Night, Ivan. Night, Bob. I press my nose against the glass and watch her walk away. All my work, all my planning, wasted. I look at Ruby, sleeping soundly, and suddenly I know she'll never leave the big top mall. She'll be here forever, just like Stella. I can't let Ruby be another one and only. Chest Beating Often when visitors come to see me, they beat their hands against their puny chests, pretending to be me. They pound away, soundless as the wet wings of a new butterfly. The chest beating of a mad gorilla is not something you ever want to hear. Not even if you're wearing earplugs. Not even if you're three miles away wearing earplugs. A real chest beating sends the whole jungle running as if the sky has broken open, as if men with guns are near. Angry. Thump. The sound, my sound, echoes through the mall. George and Julia spin around. Julia drops her backpack. George drops his keys. The pile of pictures goes flying. Thump, thump, thump. I bounce off the walls. I screech and bellow. I beat and beat and beat my chest. Bob hides under knot tag, his paws under his ears, his paws over his ears. I'm angry at last. I have someone to protect. Puzzle pieces. After a long while, I grow quiet. I sit. It's hard work being angry. Julia looks at me with wide, disbelieving eyes. I'm panting. I'm a little out of shape. What the heck was that? George demands. Something's really wrong, Julia says. I've never seen Ivan act this way. He seems to be calming down, thank goodness, George says. 
Julia shakes her head. He's still upset, Dad. Look at his eyes. My pictures are scattered all over the floor like huge autumn leaves. What a mess, George says, sighing. Wish I hadn't bothered sweeping tonight. Do you think Ivan's okay? Julia asks. Probably just a temper tantrum, George says. He reaches under a chair to retrieve a brown and red picture. Can't say I blame the guy. Stuck in that tiny cage all these years. Julia starts to answer, but then she freezes. She cocks her head. She stares at her feet where my pictures lie in disarray. Dad? She whispers. Come see this. I'm sure he's another Rembrandt, George says. Let's pick these up and not get go pick these up and get going, Jules. I'm exhausted. Dad, she says. Seriously, look at this. George follows her gaze. I see blobs. Many, many blobs, along with the occasional swirl. Please, can we go home now? That's an H, Dad. Julia kneels down, straightening one picture, then another. That's an H, and here... She grabs more pictures. Put this one here. And I don't know, maybe that one? You have an E. George rubs his eyes. I hold my breath. Julia is running now. She picks up one picture, sets down another. It's like a puzzle, Dad. This is something. It's words, maybe words? And a picture of something. A, a giant picture. Jules, George says. This is crazy. But he's looking at the floor, too, wandering from picture to picture and scratching his head. H? Julia says. E? O? O? Julia checks her, oh, chews her lower lip. H? E O? And that looks a lot like an I? H E O I. George writes in the air with his fingers. I E O H. Not the letter, an actual I. And that's a foot, or maybe a tree, and a trunk. Dad, I think that's a trunk. Julia runs to my window. Ivan, she whispers. What did you make? I stare back. I cross my arms. This is taking much longer than I'd thought it would. Humans. Sometimes they make chimps look smart. Finally. Julia and George take the pictures to the ring where there's room to see them all. An hour passes as they try to assemble my puzzle. Ruby's awake now and she and Bob and I watch. Ivan? Ruby says. Is that a picture of me? Yes, I say proudly. Where? I supposed to be? That's a zoo, Ruby. See the walls and the grass and the people looking at you? Ruby squints. Who are all those other elephants? You haven't met them, I say. Yet. It's a very nice zoo, Ruby says with an approving nod. Bob nudges me with his cold nose. It is indeed. In the ring, Julia pumps her fists in the air. Yes! She cries, I told you, Dad, there it is. H-O-M-E, home. George gazes at the letters. He spins around to look at me. Maybe it's just a coincidence, Jules. You know, a once in a trillion kind of thing. Like that old saying about the chimp and the typewriter. Give him long enough and he'll write a novel. I make a grumbling noise, as if a chimp could write a letter, let alone a book. That, how do you explain the rest of it? Julia demands. The picture of Ruby in the zoo. How do you know it's a zoo? George asks. See the circle on the gate? There's a red giraffe in it. George squints and tilts his head. Are you sure that's a giraffe? I was thinking more along the lines of a deformed cat. It's the logo for the zoo, Dad. It's on all their signs. Explain that. George gives her a helpless smile. I can't. I can't begin to. I'm just saying, there has to be a logical explanation. Look how big this is. Julia puts the last piece of Ruby's right ear into place. It's huge. It is definitely large, George agrees. Julia watches me. She chews on her thumbnail. I see the question in her eyes. She turns back to the paintings and stares at them, looking, truly looking. 
A slow smile dawns on Julia's face. Dad, she says, I have an idea. A big idea. Julia races around the edge of my painting, her arms spread wide. Billboard big. I'm not following you. I think this is meant to be on a billboard. That's what Ivan wants. George crosses his arms over his chest. What Ivan wants? He repeats slowly. And you know this because you two have been chatting? Because I'm an artist and he's an artist. Uh Uh-huh, says George. Julia clasps her hands together. Come on, Dad, I'm begging you. George shakes his head. No, I'm not doing that. No billboard, no way. I'll get the ladder, Julia says, and you get the glue. I know it's dark out, but the billboard's lit. Mac will fire me, Jules. Julia considers. But think of the publicity, Dad. Everybody would know about Ruby. You want me to put up a sign that shows Ruby in a zoo with the word home on it in giant letters? George gestures toward my pictures. A sign, (coughs) incidentally, that just happens to have been made by a gorilla? Exactly. And you want me to do it without Max's permission? George asks. Exactly. No, George says. No way. Julia goes to the edge of the ring, careful not to step on any of my paintings. She picks up Max's claw stick. She walks back and hands it to her father. George runs a finger along the blade. She's just a baby, Dad. Don't you want to help her? But how would it help, Jules? Even if lots of people see I didn't sign, it doesn't mean anything's going to change. I'm not sure exactly yet. Julia shakes her head. Maybe people will see the sign and they'll know this isn't where Ruby belongs. Maybe they'll want to help too. George sighs. He looked at he looks at Ruby. She waves her trunk. It's a matter of principle, Dad. P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L. L-E, George corrects. Dad, Julia says softly, what if Ruby ends up like Stella? George looks at me, at Ruby, at Julia. He drops the claw stick. The latter, he says quietly, is in the storage locker. The next morning, I watch Max's car slam to a halt in the parking lot. He leaps out. He stares at the billboard. His jaw is open. He doesn't move for a long time. Mad Human